Uh, Dad, the second uh, deep deep well that we want to redig uh, is this absolute commitment to the Bible as God's word, to the authority of Scripture. And uh, I know uh, from the early days uh, coming out, b both because it's the Restoration Movement, but because of your own personal conviction, that that was an unswerving thing. Talk to us about the the original vision of the church and its unswerving commitment to God's word. At that meeting, at that time, when we were talking about what the future of the church was going to be, that if they called me to be the pastor, then we were going to make a commitment that the word of God was going to be what we really stood on. And we were not going to be uh, the least bit uh, ashamed to say that where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where it's silent, we're silent. But where the Bible speaks, we're going to speak, and we're going to speak strongly about it. And that was going to be the thing that really would set our church apart from a lot of churches in the area at that time. Right. Well, you, uh, you and I have talked many times about uh, the tension that as leaders we face and the pull. Uh, the, Jesus was full of grace and truth, um, love and and holiness, and there's this pull always into legalism or into liberalism. Yes. And uh, I, I think really having that approach to scripture, did, did, you, did you guys wrestle with those things ever? There was always uh, questions as to what we're gonna do about various things. And we, we came up with a, a plan in our elders that uh, we would always, when we had an issue before us, we would first of all say, what does the word of God have to say about this? Hmm. And uh, we tried to come up with the answer to that. And that usually solved the problem if we, if we got to that point. Hmm. We said, let's trust God that if we can have a consensus of this group of men, that this is the will of God and the word of God, that it's his plan, then let's not do human voting. And so we would go around the room of the elders and ask each one if they uh, were willing to uh, take this as our position. Right. And if every one of the men did, then that became what we went with as far as a decision on that. If they did not, we would say, all right, well, let's table this. Let's spend a month praying about it. Right. And sometimes we'd come back a month later and maybe one guy had not felt really good about that decision. But after he'd prayed about it, he might say, I was wrong and I want to, to go along with the rest of us. Let's, let's make this our church's position. Uh, the, the Bible claims to be a power and to have a power not to return void. And have, have, did you see the power of God's word changing people's lives? Oh, yes, Reggie. We saw people coming here who came from almost every background you can think of. And when they became a part of our church, after a while, their attitudes about life changed, their, their views about things changed, their ideas of their family even changed. And they, I believe the preaching of the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God with the emphasis we've always had, made a difference. The word of God reached into their hearts and changed their lives. Mm. And there was tremendous power. And sometimes it just looked like it was something divine that was just amazing. Mm. I want to begin by welcoming all of you that are watching via our broadcast at the Blue Valley uh, Lee Summit and Olathe campuses. And uh, wherever you are, I'd encourage you to take out the outline that is in your bulletin. Uh, this is a little unusual for us, but I, I don't have a text today, but I'm going to throw a whole bunch of different Bible verses at you, especially in point one and point two, and they're all in that outline. But I think you may want to take some notes. And um, I, as we're moving toward our 50th anniversary, the first weekend of March, I want to encourage all of you 
to make sure that you've got that weekend blocked off on your calendars. Uh, Friday night, we're going to have a great celebration, and we'd like for all of you to be here, but there's limited space. And if you want to be part of that evening, you need to go online and register and buy a ticket. The gospel lads are going to be here singing. Tony and Shelly are going to be here singing. We have uh, lots of voices from the past that are coming in. They're going to be sharing testimonies and speaking, and it's going to be a great evening. And then on Saturday night, you don't have to register for this, but there's going to be a, a reception Saturday afternoon, and the gospel lads are going to do a concert here Saturday night, and then they will be with us uh, along with our guest speaker on uh, the Sunday morning, which is the anniversary celebration. So we want you to mark that. We want you to plan on being part of that, that great weekend. As we continue our march toward that anniversary weekend, uh, we are just like Isaiah in Genesis 26, 17, and 18, where as he followed in the footsteps of his father, we too are now digging the old wells of fresh water, or literally we're trying to rediscover and see how they apply the core values upon which our church was founded. As you heard in the video, Legacy has always been committed to living and proclaiming the Word of God. The Bible has has always been our only rule for faith and practice. And as a church, we were committed and we are still committed to trying to speak wherever the Bible speaks and to be silent when the Bible is silent. You know, the truth is, if we're not practicing those tenets, if we don't believe those things, we're not even real Christians. We can call ourselves Christians, but we're not truly authentic Christians, followers of Christ. I mean, we may live in a Christian culture. We may trace our roots to a Christian tradition. We may do many th things that would be called Christian. We may speak a lot of Christianese. But if we do not honor the authority of God's Word, we just can't call ourselves followers of Christ. You can't say, Jesus is my Lord, and not believe the things that He believed and not do the things that He commanded us all to do. Now, clearly, whenever Jesus in his life, from every historical record we have, every time Jesus sat down to teach and he opened his Hebrew scriptures, he believed that the scrolls that he held in his hand, he believed that those were the eternal words of God. In Matthew 5, 17, the Lord began his teaching ministry by saying, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the scripture. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill in John 10, 35, he referred to our Old Testament authors as those to whom the Word of God had come. And then he asserted that Scripture, the sacred writings, it, it cannot be broken. In Mark 7, 13, he rebuked the religious leaders of his day for invalidating the Word of God by supplanting what God had said in Holy Scripture with their own opinions and their own traditions. Throughout his ministry, Jesus himself obeyed carefully, and he called others to obey the same holy scriptures, the sacred writings that compose our Old Testament. He also made it clear that his life and work was not really anything new at all, but rather it was the continuing unfolding of God's eternal nature and God's eternal plan for the redemption of his people. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44, it was after he had read the scripture, Jesus said, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. So clearly, in order to be an authentic follower of Christ, we have to hold the same view of scripture that Jesus held. And Jesus validated over and over our Old Testament, but he didn't just do that. He promised over and over that the New Testament was already on its way. In John 14, 26, he told his apostles, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, the Apostle Paul describes the apostles, and there's some what we call apostolic we's in here, because he's talking about what we receive, we gave to you. You is us, right? We is the apostles. He said, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we, again, speaking of the apostles, we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. 
You see, clearly, as the Apostle Paul sat down and he wrote all these epistles that are in our New Testament, he believed that the thoughts and the words that he was writing, they were not his words, they were the Holy Spirit's. In 2 Peter 1.20, the Apostle Peter explained how this works. He said, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And I find one of the most interesting verses in the Bible is in 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter is writing, and he equates the Apostle Paul's letters. He told us what he thought of Paul's writings. He equates the Apostle Paul's letters, the wisdom that was given him with the rest of Scripture. Now, friends, that's just a small sampling. We, we could go on for an hour like this, but it's a small sampling of what we call the self-witness or the claims that the Bible makes about itself. But here's the bottom line. Jesus promised the apostles claimed they had received, and the early church believed that they had received unto martyrdom. They believed that the thoughts and the words of both our Old Testament and our New Testament, they believed that those were God's holy, inspired, and authoritative words. They were God's words to us, and they are to be obeyed. Now, if God has indeed spoken to men, and if our Bible, the canon of Judeo-Christian Scripture, is indeed the authoritative words of God, as Jesus and the Bible's authors and the church of the ages have claimed, then certainly, squarely and firmly grounding our lives and our church upon that revelation is of paramount importance. In fact, nothing is more important and nothing is more needed. The church is the only institution which Jesus founded. And it's interesting, we don't have to build the church because he promised that he would build his church and he is actively building his church. The true church is, according to the testimony of Scripture, the only body of Christ. We are his hands and feet. This is whom he is working through. This is how he is working in the world is through his church. The church is the only bride of Christ for which he has promised to someday return. So if Legacy Christian Church is going to be part of that church that Christ is building, if we're going to be in our community an accurate local expression of the Lord's body and the Lord's bride, then as we sang this morning, Jesus must be our cornerstone and our lives and all of our ministries must be squarely built upon the foundation of his apostles and his prophets that they have laid down in the writings of Scripture. Now, 50 years ago, that's the conviction that led the founders of Johnson, uh, Johnson County Christian Church, now Legacy Christian Church, to boldly declare that the Bible would be our only rule of faith and practice. They confess what I've called number one on your outline, the eternal precept. The one thing that's not going to change, the foundation of everything, and that is that God's Word is our authority. And apart from the Word of God, we have no authority. But in the Word of God, we have the divine authority of our Creator. Now, that's the fact, that's the eternal precept, but that leads us to number two, our problem, the postmodern problem, I call it, and it is that we live in a culture that has totally rejected authority, not just biblical authority, but all authority. Until just a few years ago, almost everyone in America, even non-church-going people, they gave lip service to the authority of Judeo-Christian Scripture. The Judeo-Christian ethics derived from the Judeo-Christian canon was the foundation for both societies and our culture's legal system and, frankly, for the nation's personal morality. People may not have lived that out, but they said, yeah, that's what's right and wrong. That's how you define morality. But friends, as we said last week and as we saw again in the news this week, those days are gone. Uh, many in our society reject the authority of Scripture as their basis for morality. Over the last uh, 60 years, the beliefs and values that have guided Western civilization and its development for at least 1,700 years prior have been supplanted, and all of our thinking has been impacted by it, and it is now being influenced by this all-pervasive worldview that has been called postmodernism. 
This is the worldview that now dominates our, our universities, it dominates the media, it dominates our art, and to an ever-increasing degree, the politics and personal morality of our culture. Now, last week, we, we took a little time and we did a quick in, uh, overview of the 200-year history of the Stone Campbell movement. And some of you said that was kind of a, an amazing thing. I mean, all the history people were sending me emails this week, right? The rest of you, I know, you just endure, okay? The, the Bible says you need to endure. But it's important. But what we're going to do today is even more miraculous. We're going to do a sweep of 2,000 years of Western civilization, okay? And we're going to do it quickly, but... I think we need to do it because you need to know what postmodernism is and you need to have some sense of how we got to where we are today and it may not make things better for you, but at least it will give you some understanding and insight. Let me begin with this kind of premise, this point. All Christians through the ages have believed that there's two different ways that we could know things. There's two ways to know things, uh, revelation and reason. Those are the two ways. God can come down from heaven and tell us that which we could not otherwise know. He can reveal it to us. And he has done that. He's done that through creation. We call that general revelation. He's done that through his son, who was the uh, incarnation of God, of the logos of God, the words of God. And he's done it through Holy Scripture. That's revelation. And the other way we can know something is that we can observe things and we can examine our experience and we can uh, figure things out through logic and through reasoning. That's, that's reason. So revelation and, and reason. Now, postmodernism rejects all external authorities. And this is what makes it dangerous and incongruent with biblical faith. There's a lot of churches that teach it. They teach it, they believe it, they're now based upon it, but it's not biblical faith. They've departed from any resemblance of biblical Christianity. Ironically, the first century Greco-Roman world in which the church was born was a culture that was marked by this, this uh, great cynicism, especially among people that were intellectuals, and they practiced in the first century uh, a, a real form of what we would call today postmodern thinking. They kind of thought that way. So postmodernism is nothing new. It's just something that's very ancient being reapplied. Anyway, here's the history. Jesus comes on the scene. He disciples his apostles. He founds the church. And the Jesus and the apostles and the church infected their pagan world, which was a postmodern world, with Christian thinking. They challenged everyone's worldview, everyone's thinking. And the church grew, and, and, in, and amazingly, in 300 years, by the beginning of the fourth century, a Judeo-Christian worldview had replaced most postmodernism. It had become the dominant cultural view of the Roman Empire. Most people at that time believed that God had come down from heaven and revealed eternal truth in His Holy Word, the Bible, and they believed that the church that Jesus had founded that they could see upon the earth, they believed that that was called by God to be the steward or the servant of that truth, to take care of that truth, and that's what most people believed. And over the next 1,200 years, the church had its share of bad days and its share of good days. There were days where it did a horrible job stewarding the Word of God. And there were other days where it did a wonderful job of preserving and protecting and proclaiming and, and sharing the Word of God with the lost world. And everywhere the church did a good job sharing the Word of God, there was blessing in people's lives and, and human civilization advanced. And everywhere they didn't, darkness prevailed. Basically, from 312 A.D. to 1500 A.D., most of Western society believed that the Bible was God's authoritative word for all people. And because the Bible said it, and the Bible does say it, they also believed that all authority structures, all the things we see in our world, that, that the authority is ordained by God. And they believed that God himself had vested his authority in, in husbands and fathers and pastors and kings and their agents. However, they also believed that that authority was not autonomous, but all who were in authority were going to be held accountable by God and were in fact responsible before God right now as they led, as they ruled, to live their lives and to lead according to the principles of truth and justice that are set forth in the higher authority of God's Word. Now, in the early 1500s, Martin Luther and the Reformers came along, and 
they believed that the institution of the church had not been a good steward of the word. In fact, they believed that the institution of the church and the hierarchy of the church had usurped God's authority. And instead of being the steward of it, they had used it to advance their own ends, their own human desires, or they feathered their own nest with it. And Luther believed that the Bible was God's absolute revelation, his authoritative word, and that the church and its preachers were the stewards of the word. And when they spoke, if they're preaching the word, they spoke with the authority of God. Now, they believe that as long as they were faithfully exegeting Scripture. They start giving their own opinions. They no longer have authority. But as they faithfully exegete Scripture, they have the authority of God. And Luther is my hero of all human history. I mean, outside of Jesus, he, he's my hero of history. But uh, there's one thing he did, and I still haven't figured out whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. But whether he meant to do it or not, one of the things he did was he elevated reason to a place almost equal with revelation. And he, I say he did that because he argued that for people, uh, it was not enough for people who claim to be people of God to act upon what the church said, the Bible said. Luther taught that every believer is called by God to be a priest of God. And so as a priest, he needs to personally understand what the Bible says, not just what others say about it. And then he needs to willingly submit to its authority through his own informed conscience. And so it, that changed everything. For example, now you, the main thing that you're going to teach kids to read so they can read the Bible for themselves. But you have everyone who's, who's trying to inform their conscience with the word and their reasoning gets almost elevated to the place of the revelation. Now, that changed everything. It changed politics. It changed philosophy. The whole world changed because of the Reformation. And people began to think about the implications of what he said in other areas. And 100 years later, in 1960, there was, uh, in the 1600s, excuse me, there was a, a very famous philosopher. His name is Rene Descartes. He's famous for his axiom, I think, therefore I am. And he began thinking deeply about what we call epistemology, which epistemology is the study of how we can know things for certain. It's how do we know something is true. And uh, for Descartes, knowledge began by doubting everything. He did not deny the possibility of God. In fact, apart from Scripture, he developed an ontological proof for, the, for a benevolent God. He, he proved in, ontologically that there is a God that exists without using Scripture. He never denied the things revealed in Scripture, but he denied that we could ever know those things for certain in this world. So Descartes elevated reason above revelation by asserting that all we can know for sure are those things that are evident through reason. And he is known as the father of modern philosophy and the father of what's called rationalism. Well, this idea of rationalism, it, it grew. And by the 1700s, that growth of rationalism had led to what we call the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was a big deal. Enlightened thinkers all across Europe and in the United States, especially in Europe, though, especially in France, they began to, they began to believe that through reason alone, through sound logic, people could eventually discern the truth. By the way, this is, this is a free sidebar. All of the American founders were products of the Enlightenment. They read all the enlightened authors. They were, they were part of this. Many of them were devout Christians who firmly believed that God had revealed truth in Scripture. But because the Word of God, in, in the Greek, it's the logos, okay? It's reasoning. It's logical. Because they believe that the Word of God is logos, they, they believe that that whatever God says is also going to be consistent with that which is logical and reason. It's not going to conflict with that. And they, they believe that we can know truth because Scripture revealed it, but it's consistent with reason. And the rest of the founders who were not devout Christians were what we would call deist. And what they shared in common with the Christians was they believed in something called natural law. They believed that there is truth. There's right and there's wrong, and there is eternal, absolute truth, and that a creator has bound this up in the hearts of men. He's, he's revealed it to us. And if we just were able to think rationally, we would come to understand that. And so both the Christians and the deists could agree that there was an absolute truth that could be known through reason. 
And thus they were able to say things like, we hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, any reasonable person ought to be able to see this. That men have been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Governments don't give rights to men. Governments must not take rights away from men because they're from God. Now, this age of rationalism evolved quickly into a radical empiricism. And by that, we just mean the refinement of what we call today the scientific method. There have been scientists before. Aquinas was a scientist, but I mean real science exploded at this point in time. And great thinkers everywhere begin exploring the universe with new tools of observation and empirical verification and using the scientific method to challenge things. Along with that empiricism, the philosophers developed the concept of logical positivism. And this is a little subtle shift. It asserts that only things that can be verified and analyzed empirically are meaningful. Now think about that. What people were saying is that if you can't experiment on it, if you can't prove something rationally, they weren't saying it doesn't exist or it's not real. They're just saying it's not important. It's irrelevant. Which leads you to a, a totally extremely materialistic view of the universe in which only reason counts and basically any value of revelation is set aside. Well, logic and science clipped along and they made tremendous advances, especially in technology. And uh, things are going pretty well, you know, until the 1900s, the 20th century. Most of us, most of us here were born in that century. And then in the middle of that century, people begin observing the mess that was the world. And uh, specifically, the, the mess caused by man's inhumanity to men and totalitarianism, Nazism, and communism, Marxist socialism that, that killed, you know, Hitler killed six million Jews. The communists killed a hundred million people of their own people, a hundred million just in the, in the 20th century, in the 1900s. And people were watching this take place before their eyes. And, and then they saw World War II and the devastation of it and how all this wonderful scientific developed technology was used to slaughter people and maim people. And the French existentialists, people like Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre, they exploded on the scene. And when I was in college, this is all my professors were existentialists, and I had to read all these guys, and this is who we talked about. Existentialism is, uh, you know, most philosophy through the years has been worried, has, has been concerned with the meaning of life or the essence of life. And the existentialist says, there is no essence, there's no meaning, there's just existence. But, but to their credit, they basically said, hey, you guys have all your science and your reasoning and those things are good and important and they're practical, but uh, they don't get to all of life. Not everything's covered by science and logic. And they said, I feel things and I, I want things and I need things. But here's what the existentialist said. I have a free will. A lot of scientists didn't believe they had a free will. Okay, the psychologists then who were scientists, not like today, they were scientists and, and they were Skinnerites and they believed that conditioning and everything and you don't have a free will. The existentialist said, no, I, I get to make choices. And in fact, my choices are what give my life meaning, whatever I choose. And they said, I can make good choices or bad choices. And if you're a, if you're a noble person, you accept the personal responsibility of the consequences of the choice you make. And this is what the existentialist taught. And they said, I make choices and those choices have meaning for me, even if you can't measure it or verify it. And I need to be responsible for my choices. The existentialist wrote stories because stories convey emotional components better than philosophical or scientific proofs. So they kind of put all this literature together. Beginning in, really in the 1960s and probably reaching its heyday in the 1980s, and now, now it's got from the academic world to the rest of us, there was a group of academics that began challenging the existentialist. And the part they challenged was the, the meaning of the existentialist. They said, yeah, you can say you have meaning, but you're deceiving yourself because the choices you make are just a product of the biases that you have because of the identity group that you belong to. And it's all fake, it's all phony, and those aren't real. And in a way, they probably were right. The problem is they now absolve people of responsibility. 
The most famous proponents of this emerging philosophy were Jacques Derrida and Michael Foucault. They're all atheists. And they began by analyzing literature and using the method of deconstruction, breaking down all the structures, all the authority, the accepted forms and meanings. And it started off just a way of analyzing literature, but before long they were applying it to every area of life. And I'm going to sum this up for you, and we're, we're about out of this section, okay? So hang, hang on. This is important. Here's the tenets of postmodernism. There's three of them. And this is what postmodernists believe. There is no truth. There's just perception. There's just, there's just people have different perspectives. There's a million of them. Those perspectives are determined by things that you can't control. There's no truth. There is no meaning you can say you have meaning, but you're deceiving yourself. There's no meaning to anything. Just, it just is. And, and finally, there can never be any certainty. That's postmodernism. It's, it's a mood. They're, we're just here. There's no truth. There's no meaning. There's no certainty. And this leads them to this axiom. When we read Scripture, when, when you read Scripture, if you're a postmodernist, or you read a law that's been on the books for years, or you read the Constitution of a country, this is the deal. It is the reader, it's the reader, not the author, who gets to decide what the words mean. The reader decides what it means. It doesn't matter what the author thought, what the author intended, the context of the writing, none of that stuff matters. It's how I feel about what's being said. It's all about how the reader feels the story should go, or he thinks it should. Postmodernists reject all external rules. They reject definitions. They reject meaning. And most of all, they reject any authority from the outside. Now, this leads to all kinds of naive utopianism and, frankly, silliness. But those who are in a day with this paradigm, they have an amazing ability to pick and choose the facts they want, and ignore facts and ignore realities of life. Well, I'm not going to do that because I don't feel that. You know, that I, I know the world's always operated that way, but I, I'm not going there. Well, this is what's going to happen to you. No, it's not. Well, it, yes, it is. I don't feel that. By the way, here's a simple test to see the degree to which you have been, and we've all been infected, but this is the degree to which you have been infected by the demonic worldview that is postmodernism. Here's, here's how you can test yourself. As you look at your character and you look at your life and you look at your personality, is it marked by a strong sense of personal responsibility and deep gratitude? Are you a grateful person and are you a person that feels responsible for the situation you're in? Or victimhood and resentment? It's somebody else's fault. I'm oppressed. Even if it's true, it's not helpful thinking, by the way. Christians, here's, here's the bottom line. Christians trust in a sovereign God, right? We believe that Jesus is Lord and he's king of the universe and he's in control of our lives. And we all do things and we make bad choices and thank God for his grace. But most of the time when we make bad choices, most of the time when we suffer, or a lot of times when we suffer, it's because of the choices we make. And so we confess our sins and we restore that relationship and we start making right choices. And Christians believe there's a way of curse and there's a way of blessing. And you're responsible for the choices you make. And you know what? Sometimes things just happen because the whole world's a fallen world. It's all messed up. We're all broken. Everyone around us is broken. And sometimes other people's choices impact us. But Christians believe that there's a sovereign God sitting on the throne and he's allowing these things to happen and even when we don't like it, even when we don't trust it, even when we feel like, I didn't choose this, this is just happening to me, I don't deserve it, we can trust that this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God is going to work all things for the good, either now or in eternity. And we can trust in His plan. This is the Christian worldview. Postmodernists blame others, and they absolve themselves and if they believe in God, they'll blame God. But most of them don't believe in God eventually. But there's no responsibility on them for the problems of their life. It, it might, they might blame someone that's been dead for 500 years, but th someone else is responsible for all of my problems. They are driven to create change in their world 
by resentment and a desire to take revenge upon their identified oppressors. And this me-centric mindset is very popular. But friends, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. The first time we see this thinking in all human history, you know where it is? Genesis chapter 3. That's really old. And it came from a demonic source. The first time you see postmodernism is when the serpent said to Eve, did God really say you must not eat of this tree? Beloved, Eve knew exactly what God had said, and she understood exactly what God had meant. She understood exactly what God wanted. But the devil was saying to her, you know, you, you, can, you can make those words mean whatever you want them to mean. After all, you're a poor victim of God's oppressive patriarchy. I mean, who does he think he is anyway? Does he think he's the God of the universe or something? And, and what, what did the devil say to her? He said, you know, God's not concerned about equality. That's not on his priority list. He knows that the day you eat of this, you'll see good and evil just like him, and you'll be just like him, and then you'll, you'll be equal, which is their highest goal. Of course, that very thinking is what got Satan kicked out of heaven. Because he said, I will be like the most high, and the most high said, no, you won't. You're gone. And Adam and Eve said, I'll be like the most high, and said, no, now you're going to die, and you're out of the garden, and it's your responsibility. It's your fault. Postmodernists reject both revelation and they elevate themselves to the place of God. And they're not responsible for any of the problems. Others are. And it's nothing new. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking or reasoning, their, their, re, their ability to, to follow things logically, it became futile. And their foolish hearts, and the word foolishness, it, it does have the idea of being moronic in it, right? It has that idea, but it's also about rebellion. It's about a rebellious heart, a, a heart that will not submit to authority. It was darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They became rebels. And friends, our world today is filled with angry, arrogant people who deny facts and they deny reason and they deny reality and they deny revelation and they deny any responsibility for their own lives because they reject authority and they deny even their creator the right to tell them how they should think, how they should feel, much less how they should behave. Ravi Zacharias illustrates the foolishness and the absolute hypocrisy of this philosophy, this way of thinking. And all postmodernists, they, they have this philosophy and they'll fight and fight and fight as long as it's affecting you. When it affects them, they, they give it up for a moment. If you were on a plane and this plane was in a storm with zero visibility and horrible turbulence, do you want your pilot to be a rational modernist or a compassionate postmodernist? The modern pilot says, I can't see a thing here, but the controller on the radio says that I'm flying at this altitude in this direction, so I'm just going to follow all the rules of my training. I'm going to trust in the empirically verified science that is embedded in my instruments to get me through this storm. And in contrast, the postmodern pilot says, you know what, I know what the guy on the radio is saying, I know what the instruments all say, but that's just one interpretation of the truth. And I'm going to act according to my feelings about my truth. Well, let's say you're going to have a serious surgery. Do, do you want a postmodern surgeon, you know, feeling his way along? Or do you want a doctor who is a person of reason follow, following established rules and medical protocols? And who do you want in charge of your government and economy? And whose counsel are you going to listen to in regard to your marriage and your family? And most important of all is... Who do you want guiding you from life in this world into eternity? Number three, I want us to consider the essential principles in the acrostic scan. 
And uh, I just tell you real fast, this is how we're going to apply point number one going forward. We saw what the church was founded on. We're a church that believes in authority. We're living in a culture which has rejected authority. And by the way, tremendous pressure is going to come upon us in this culture. Tremendous pressure. But here's our future. This is what we're going to believe. This is what we're not going to compromise. We've been teaching this acrostic to our elders and staff. It's our way of saying the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice. First and foremost, we are absolutely committed to the sufficiency of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.15 says the sacred writings are able to give us the wisdom that leads to salvation. In 1 Peter 2.2, we are told to long for the pure milk of the word by which we can grow in respect to salvation. And of course, 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, the Bible contains everything that we need to be saved, to grow in our faith, and to be equipped to serve God in our lives. Now, there may be a lot of other tools helpful. If your car breaks down, the Bible's not going to help you very much, right? There's other tools out there that are helpful. But we don't need the Bible and technology. We don't need the Bible and human philosophy. We don't need the Bible and psychology or science or medicine or government for us to be and do all the things that God has called us to be and do. We need the Word of God because it is powerful. And that power and the promises of that word in those things, we have all that pertains to life and godliness. Right here is all we need to know how to get to heaven and how to live a life here on earth that pleases him. Number two, we believe in the clarity of scripture. We're committed to it. The clarity of scripture. And this is not to say that everything in the Bible is crystal clear to everyone. Frankly, it's not clear to anyone. But here's what we can trust. Everything that God thinks, everything God knows and wants us to know, that stuff he's made very clear. A lot of stuff we can study for a long time and not be clear, but that stuff is clear. Because our loving Father isn't hiding from us the things that we need to know about him, about ourselves, about our world or about eternity. Scripture is revelation. The word revelation means the unveiling. It's not the hiding. It's the unveiling of God's nature and God's purposes and God's plans. Thirdly, we trust in the authority of Scripture. This means we're never going to apologize for authoritatively saying the Bible says, I, I went to a conference a few weeks ago. They said, you know, young millennials, they reject authority. So you need to never say the Bible says. Listen, if I don't say the Bible says, they're never going to come under the authority of Christ. And if they never come under the authority of Christ, they're not going to go to heaven. The church doesn't need to change. They've got to change their mindset about the authority of Christ. We're not going to apologize for saying, thus saith the Lord and speaking authoritatively we don't apologize for taking the scripture and teaching it and using it to reprove and correct and to train. Eugene Peterson writes, the Holy Scripture is the source document. It is the authoritative font, the work of the Holy Spirit that is definitive in all true spirituality. Friends, apart from this book, there is no spirituality. That's all phony and fake. The words of God are the commands of our king. And if we're part of the kingdom... We need to obey them. Finally, we acknowledge the necessity of Scripture. Romans 1 says it is the gospel. It's that good news of what Christ has done for all of us fallen sinners who are responsible for our own sin and horrible predicaments. That is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, who, who puts their trust in Jesus. So let me summarize the sufficient, clear, authoritative, necessary word of God. That's how we know Jesus. And that's the foundation of our church. And today, if you've not done so, we invite you, in fact, we plead with you to confess Jesus as Lord and make his word the firm foundation of your life. Father, we thank you for our time together and 
Father, I, I pray that, that you would give us both insight and courage. Insight to understand your truth and how it needs to be applied in this world. And Father, the courage to trust you and to live that out. And Lord, as, we, as we've walked by faith, would you bless us? And Father, would you use us to bring glory to Jesus? And it's in his name we pray. Amen.